All right, welcome back to another episode of Small Business Chronicles, where we hear stories in business of all different kinds, and we have really become kind of the Swiss Army knife in the business world. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm really excited to chat with our guest today. Um, and Ralph is actually joining us from uh, not too far from me. Uh, they're in the Chicago area, greater Chicago area. And he has over 15 years of experience as a full-time travel photographer and international tour organizer. Um, his tours, by the way, they're five-star rated, and he has been everywhere. Uh, he's he's traveled 30 countries, six continents. Um, he's led over 120 highly rated international tours. And I'm really excited to dive in to hear about his journey, his experiences as a globetrotting entrepreneur. Uh, and I know that this is going to be a great conversation where all of you guys are going to get some some uh, some great insights. So be ready to take some notes um, and let's jump into it. So Ralph, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fantastic. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm excited to chat. I, I love to travel. I think that uh, everybody does. Um, but, you know, I, I'm really curious um, about, um, you know, what really drew you into the touring business and um, drew you into really seeing this as something that um, you can make a living at. And, and you know, I, I know that you and I have chatted off offline, but I always like to start the show by saying, hey, who are you? Why should we be so excited to listen to you? I'm excited, but I want to make sure that our listeners uh, are just as excited as I am. Great. Yeah. I've, uh, I like to say I've always been a traveler. So since I was 15 and in high school, I studied in Spain for a summer. The next summer, I uh, was a volunteer in Peru. The following summer, I was a volunteer in Venezuela. And the next summer, I studied in Mexico City. So from a young age, I was uh, traveling internationally by myself or with, uh, you know, organized groups. So, you know, not the parents kind of thing. But uh, so I was hooked uh, from day one in Spain. And so I've always loved Spain and specific uh, Europe and specifically Spain. But uh, it just got the juices going. And since then, which was a long, long time ago, I always wanted to figure out a way to make a living from travel. But a, you know, back then in the late eighties, nineties, uh, there there really was no internet, and we didn't have social media, digital photography. So, kind of, there was uh, everything came together in the early two thousands, I'll say, and uh, when digital photography started to be. Uh, become something that everyone was starting to learn about and think about, uh, buying new digital cameras and then eventually smartphones and things. Uh, and then we had the internet with uh, being able to research and do social media marketing. Uh, everything sort of came together. And from 2001 to 2004, I had my second restaurant in downtown Chicago. And about five months after I opened in 2001, May of 2001, we had 9-11. And I was in the city of Chicago, and everyone thought that the, you know, the, the next big city was going to be Chicago or San Francisco. So it was tough because, you know, being a new restaurant owner and having a space and having to make a living five lunches a week, which was really all that I had available to me being in that part of the city where it was mostly the business center. Um, I had to introduce catering to really uh, boost my, my, my sales because there just wasn't the walk-in business and people were staying in their offices and catering worked out really well. So anyway, to make a long story longer, I was getting to the end of my uh, initial three-year lease on my restaurant and I had to decide if I was going to sign for another five years. And so I decided that uh, I was going to take a, a yellow pad and on the left side, I wrote the, the negatives about owning a restaurant, things like uh, having to have employees and having a retail space and leases and landlords and putting things in people's mouths that could get them sick, like food. <laughs> and so on the right side of the paper, I, I wrote the opposite of those things. And I said, I don't want to have employees. I want to work wherever I am. Uh, I don't want to work with something like uh, food that people ingest and, and may make them sick. So um, I 
you know, I, it was kind of the perfect time to say, boy, digital photography is just coming to be in the early 2000s, more or less, you know, it was just starting to become commercial. And I said, I bet uh, people might pay me to uh, teach them how to use their new digital devices. And I started thinking about some walking tours that I could do in Chicago. And I said, uh, well, maybe this isn't the best place to do it because of the weather, as we're all experiencing right now. Uh, you know, it really limits, um, you know, although Chicago gets a really bad rap, it, it, it shouldn't get as bad a rap as it does. But uh, I said, uh, I, I, I think I should do this somewhere where the weather's better. And I had lived out in Southern California before, and a friend of mine was out there. And he said, why don't you get your financial services licenses to be a stockbroker and work for me because that's what he did. So I ended up doing that, and I was gonna. So I started doing the, the walking tours and the one on ones and uh, teaching at the local city of Newport Beach uh, adult education program, Santa Ana College, Saddleback College, uh, teaching uh, night and weekend courses for adults that didn't require me to have a teaching degree, but that would get me in front of people that would pay me money to potentially, uh, you know, teach them how to do photography. So that's pretty much how it started. And then it was a slow burn from there. And then in uh, September of 2008, we all know what happened. And that was the financial crisis. Well, here I am a, a, a newbie financial advisor and, uh, you know, the stock market fell off a cliff. So I always say the next day was the day I went full time. So that was about coming up on 16 years ago now. Best day of well, my life. It, it, <laughs> I love I love this story too because you know restaurant tour to uh, financial uh, services to uh, you know um, uh, a passion that starts as a part time and then goes into full time you know I mean and I think that's a journey that a lot of the people that listen to our show and yeah, I mean I I know I personally like I I'm 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 in the real estate space but I didn't start there I started with music and then you know went into HR did the corporate thing and then you know took the natural progression to you know, shifting from something that where I was working for somebody else uh, to being that solopreneur, right? Where I can actually be in control of my own schedule. So, um, sure. and you know, I, I I can't imagine that there's uh, that there's uh, not people that are listening to this and saying, "Man, Ralph has got a mate. He gets to do. Uh, he gets to see beautiful areas and take amazing pictures and get paid to do it." So, so, so is it just walking tours that you started with, or did you do you know? Uh, is it the, the full travel uh, schedule? I mean, paint me a picture of, of of what kind of tours that you do now compared to where you started. Yeah, so when I started, it was just maybe two hours one on one across the kitchen table from someone going over their digital camera, you know, their one megapixel camera, and showing them how to use it, all the dials and buttons and everything. And then it turned into, let's go out and shoot in the area where I was living in Southern California at the time. And it was beautiful. So we could always do that. And then it turned into half day tours and full day tours and then uh, weekends and uh, started bringing groups overnight to uh, Death Valley and, and Joshua Tree National Park. And then I started bringing groups back to Chicago so I could get a free trip back home. And uh, then I got approached by a tour, a big tour company that had heard that I did these kinds of, you know, s s shorter type trips. And they said, would you be interested in bringing some groups onto our tours? And so I looked into it and I said, sure. And so my first international trip with a group was to the Central European Christmas markets. And so we were part of a bigger group. That, um, of course, I didn't have any control over timing or, you know, whether we did or didn't do things when we were able to get out in the better light and things like that. And but it was a great way to sort of get introduced to, uh, you know, being out with a group internationally. And so it grew from there. And finally, I uh, started doing <clears throat> other international trips. And a uh, uh, quick story I told uh, I tell is uh, about the the pain in Spain is what I call it, and uh, I was looking to uh, to you know weed out the middleman and not have to uh, go through someone to create these trips, which I was doing before. And I found out very quickly that that was a mistake and that these people earn every penny. So 
when I uh, think about that trip where it was you know, four places, Toledo, Madrid, Segovia, and Barcelona, uh, I had to deal with 36 different vendors from hotels to transportation, guides, activities, restaurants. I had to explain to them who I was, why they should work with me. And here I am a newbie, you know, at that point, maybe one or two years into it. And so no history whatsoever. So that was a nightmare. So finally, I decided I'm going to work with one person in the destination who knows everything and everyone and just tell them exactly what I'm looking for. And then together, we could put together these up to two-week trips. And so it was a real uh, slow burn that uh, happened over the course of you know, probably five to seven years uh, before you know, I really got comfortable doing this all on my own. But I still do work you know, with I, the local tour operators. I I, I love and it, I love this story because it does apply to other businesses, right? Um, so you 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 saw you saw something that somebody else was doing at a high level, and you replicated mm-hmm. it, and you found that the return on investment for your time and your headache, I mean, let's be honest, uh, wasn't worth it. So, you know, I, I we talk a lot about leverage on this show. We talk a lot about um, how to get. Uh, uh, how to grow and scale a business. And I think partnering with people that do something at a really high level is a great way to do that. Um, so um, let's, I mean, let's talk numbers. I mean, you know, financially, was it a, a higher return on your investment to go ahead and pay those people in the in the individual locations versus, you know, managing all of that stuff on your own? Yeah, I probably ended up spending about the same amount of money, whether it was me and my assistant trying to put together these trips on our own, having to pay her my time and you know, spending hours and hours doing this when I could work with that one person and the markup that they gave me really wasn't that much. And of course, I passed that on to the clients. They didn't notice it because it really didn't turn out to be that much. And uh, it was the best thing I ever did because now I saved a bunch of time, a bunch of headaches, and I had much better information than me trying to figure it all out. Because I, you know, they say, Ralph, no, that's not a good time of year. There's a convention in town or, you know, that's the monsoon season or whatever it might be, which I may not have found and may have had to, to learn the hard way, which is never a good thing when you're, you know, with a, with a group. So, so I, I, I would love to talk about how you, um, how you market your business. Cause I can imagine that, um, you know, in the business that you've had in the time that you've had it, I mean, technology has changed. Social media has changed. Everything went from horizontal to vertical as far as, uh, you know, uh, a lot of photography goes, people's phones now are, are, uh, as high quality as, as a typical DSLR camera. Um, so, uh, how do you advertise a service? Um, that, uh, and, and how do you, I mean, how, how do you stick to that moving target? Well, part of it was, uh, doing those adult education programs. So if people are looking to, uh, create businesses, you may look at whether there's an opportunity to teach an adult education program at your local city or community college. And that might be a really great way to test your, uh, your business idea, see if there's an interest get in front of people that are obviously interested in it if they're taking the course. So that's what I did. And I would get in front of anyone, whether it was three people or 300 that had an interest in photography and uh, travel. Now, earlier on with digital photography, let's say from 2008 to 2016, 17, that was mostly the DSLRs and the new mirrorless cameras and things like that. So I was uh, doing everything I could to network into groups where people were uh, wanting to learn about, again, those new digital devices, getting better at them, get out and shoot. Uh, So I was doing everything to do that. Now it is much more digital uh, phones and even I'm shooting much more with my phone than ever, especially because I'm shooting video for my YouTube channel. But it's, uh, you know, these cameras are so high quality that you can still get some great shots. And the first tip in my book is that it's not about the camera. So, hmm. um, you know, getting out there. But uh, the other thing that I do is I speak at uh, the 
travel shows, photography shows, camera clubs, uh, the local libraries, again, still trying to get in front of anyone that uh, may be interested in uh, specifically travel, but also photography. Like this weekend, I'm speaking at a, a local wine shop here in town uh, because I'm creating a trip to Spain for them. And I have this amazing trip to northern Spain where we go wine tasting and uh, do all kinds of tours and amazing food. And so that, you know, I saw this wine shop and, you know, of course, their people are interested in wine and food. And, uh, you know, like you say, most everyone's interested in travel. So, again, it's just about getting in front of that target market. So finding out what your target market is and then doing whatever you can to get in front of those people. I mean, I, I just, you know, I want you guys that are listening to really take note of that. I mean, because um, that's huge. I mean, if you didn't write down notes there, you should have. E education and speaking in the space with your target market. Go where your people are. Uh, I call that putting yourself in the way of business, right? Um, and from a cost perspective, I mean, let's be honest, Ralph. Like, you could spend, uh, I mean, any infinite number of dollars on uh, marketing, on digital marketing, on social media marketing, on you know um, paid ads, Google uh, ad search, SEO. I mean, uh, you name it. But it is uh, more effective with higher conversion, and it's a lot more uh, cost effective to just go straight where your consumers or your or your your customers are that would actually utilize your service. So. Uh, genius, by the way. I want to commend you for that. And I, I know that other businesses um, could take that model and actually place it with whatever their industry or whatever their service is, right? Uh, so. Absolutely. And I, yeah, excuse me. But um, I, and to tell you the truth, I've done all the Facebook ads, the Google ads, I've hired the social media marketing people. And I don't know that I've ever once got a client from spending those dollars. And instead, I've gotten them from doing these speaking engagements where sometimes I'm getting paid to do those. Other times, I, I will spend my time and, and do it for free in exchange for their them giving me the opportunity to be in front of that target audience. That's huge for me. Um, so you just never know. And uh, so it's it's worked out. I'd love to uh, do public speaking uh, podcasts. I mean, here we are. You know, what what another great way that didn't exist, uh, you know, even five, seven years ago at, at this level that it is uh, to uh, get in front of now your audience with my message. And, you know, it's I just mean, podcasts it's content. are absolutely fantastic. It's another free speaking opportunity. Well, and YouTube, yeah. I mean, I know you have an avid, um, uh, an active YouTube channel. I mean, another great way to to, to build a business. Yes. And you know, I, I think a lot of our uh, a lot of our listeners are starting to get this if they've been listening to uh, to us for a while. But I see a lot of new business owners or struggling business owners, um, in particular solopreneurs, that just uh, they just get they hit that wall. And they buy into the fact that you you, know, you have to spend money to make money. And I've just found that that is not universally true. It just takes a really uh, smart business plan where you're targeting the people that you want to be in front of. So uh, I, now I do want to talk a little bit about your book because you you have – You've taken your 15 years and six continents worth of experience uh, and all the hard knocks and actually, um, you know, um, taken that information and turned to author. So tell us a little bit more about um, your your book and uh, what it's about, who, who would really enjoy reading it. Sure. So I, I wrote a book uh, recently, and it's probably my fourth or fifth book, actually. But uh, this one is called uh, 60 Affirmations for Travel, and it's affirmations that people can use uh, and work with on the road. And so affirmations are like uh, ways, or they're, they're just little nuggets of positivity that you can repeat to yourself and absorb and be a more mindful and intentional traveler and therefore get much more out of your experience than just kind of going and seeing what happens. It's sort of a a roadmap or a guideline to keep you centered and focused on what's happening on that trip that you're on. And uh, 
obviously you don't have to do it on a trip and it can be something that can inspire you to travel or uh, keep you in that mindset of, you know, I've, I, I want to keep thinking about travel and, and, uh, you know, that's going to manifest itself and, you know, I'll be able to get out there at some point. But, uh, the idea is, uh, with uh, the with the, these sort they're sort of manifestations that uh, the affirmations that uh, I've also got some coloring. Uh, I I didn't even realize that adult coloring books were a thing, but there's uh, I've I've incorporated some beautiful travel icons in there that people can doodle on color. Again, inspiring you to think of these new places that you may never even heard of, and uh, and just keep focused and. Uh, Again, being a mindful and intentional traveler. That's the whole idea. I, I love that, Ralph. I mean, I think I, I talk about mindset in business a lot, and most people do. Um, but in reality, most people, uh, you know, they go on vacation and they check out and they, they leave their affirmations, they leave their mindset at home. And, you know, I understand the intent of that is you're wanting to unplug. Um, but you also don't want to do it at the cost of, uh, you know, not enjoying your vacation or not having the right mindset while you're on it. You know, I, I, I've had those vacations. I'm sure other people have where something goes wrong or you're just in a bad mood or the person that you're with, you know, your significant other is just not in the right mindset to be uh, where they're at. So I love that approach. That's fantastic. So where, where can yeah, no, where can we find information on it? I mean, what what um, where all is your book located right now? Sure. Right now it's uh, just available on Amazon and you could just search for 60 affirmations for travel and I'm writing it under the Continental Drifter byline. So if you go in there and I'll give you a link to it and you can uh, uh, check that out. But uh, it's only $7.99 right now. I uh, will be increasing the price in the next month or two as the book uh, starts to age a little bit because... uh, you know, I, I want to get it out there. I want people to to read it, review it, and uh, hopefully that will lead to more book sales down the line. Uh, but uh, yeah. just back to your idea about traveling, uh, you know, it depends on the kind of trip you're on. You know, if you're going on a trip where you're just like, hey, I've been working my tail off. I want to go to the beach and I just want to check out for, for seven days. Uh, you know, that's one thing. And, and of course, you could still maintain a book like this, no problem, five minutes a day. But um, if you're on a trip where, let's say, uh, you know, it's a once in a lifetime trip to say, you know, I don't know, Cambodia or India or something, um, you know, a lot of times people just sleep in and they'll miss the best part of the day, which to me is early, earlier morning, not early, early morning sunrises, but uh, getting out after breakfast, before the, before the uh, tourist crowds, before the heat of the day, best light of the day. And instead, if you're sleeping in and you miss that, now you're out, you know, when all the tourists are out and the light's terrible, you're not getting very good photographs, everything's crowded, and maybe that's why you're a little bit ticked off. Right. So yeah. if you just make that little extra effort to get out early. And then I say, take a photographer siesta in the middle of the day, you know, when all those things are negative, light, people, crowds, um, and then get out later in the day when the light's again good. So it's about timing. And, um, you know, I understand when people say, well, I'm on vacation, you know, I want to sleep in. Well, it, it, I guess it depends on the kind of vacation and people can, of course, do what they want, but uh, it, it just depends. I know for me and my wife, we went to uh, we went to Japan uh, last year and this was our 15-year wedding anniversary, our bucket list trip. And we actually wow. found that using jet lag in our favor was a, was, a, was a great strategy because we started our trip uh, in Kyoto. Uh, which is where uh, the best time to be at the, the the temples and shrines and some of the best pictures that we got while we were on our trip happened uh, bright, bright and early before anybody else had even had breakfast. We were there, uh, right there uh, with nobody there. We got beautiful pictures and it was a natural uh, time for us to be awake after our travel anyway because uh, of the, of that time difference. So we just, Absolutely. we leaned That's into it. And it, it worked. It worked phenomenally well for what was for us. I mean, a bucket list uh, trip. So, uh, love that, that tip. That love the book. Sense. Yeah, yeah. If I can make um, just one, I, if I, if I can make just oh, one ahead. more point. Um, uh, speaking of what you're just saying, that's brilliant. 
Um, I, I've got a trip coming up to Swedish and Finnish Lapland to see the Northern Lights. Well, what we might do, and the Northern Lights come out at night, of course, or you know, they're they're around all day, but you can see them the best at night, of course. So, what we may do is just stay on U.S. time zone and be up when we want to be, instead of like being up all day and then trying to stay up all night to uh, see the lights. So, why not just stay on? the U S time zone. And then we're in the perfect timing, you know, all the time that we're there. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, a, great, no, it's, that's a great point. Yeah. I, we, um, yeah, we took advantage of it in the morning. And then as the trip went on, we took advantage of Tokyo nightlife for the same reason. Right. So you know, we just, <laughs> we kind of went with our natural rhythm and took advantage of the, the different times of day. So, uh, love it. Well, Ralph, I know we could talk uh, about travel, talk about business all day long. We are getting a little bit closer to the end of our time. So I, I want to make sure that I give all of our listeners an opportunity to connect with you wherever uh, wherever you're at. And I know you've got your YouTube channel. Uh, you've already talked about your book. But if someone's interested in doing a walking tour or finding more information uh, about what you do, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Sure. So everything is in the hub of my website at continentaldrifter.co. And you can find everything about uh, my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash continental drifter. And I'm also on all the social media outlets at Ralph Velasco and uh, also slash continental drifter on a lot of them. But uh, I'm pretty somewhat active on Facebook. So uh, people can follow along there and I would love it. But uh, continentaldrifter.co is where people can find just about everything. And I'd, I'd love to, uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, it's ralph at continentaldrifter.co. Appreciate That's it. fantastic. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, I... I really appreciate everybody tuning in, and and thanks again for uh, for having a conversation uh, with me, Ralph. I really really enjoyed it. Again, if you guys enjoyed uh, listening to to Ralph, make sure you check him out. Uh, and if you found today's conversation inspiring, don't forget to you know do all the podcast things. Give us a like, a rate, a subscribe. Uh, check Ralph out on his channels too. Um, and as a reminder, this is a part of the Small Business Network. Uh, of podcast where uh, where we do all things podcast in the business space. Uh, we're proudly produced by Titan Media Works. So uh, if you guys want to check out more of our other shows, you guys know where to where to find us. So until next time, keep up that entrepreneurial spirit and just remember that every small business has a big story. So I'm your host Brian Stone. We'll see you guys next time.